Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is our 362nd episode being recorded on August 12th, 2015. I'm Ryan Schrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Sebastian P. Uh, where's I'm Alan? Where's, so glad to be here. Where's Alan? Oh, he's not here. Oh. Oh. He claims to be at the most technologically advanced city in the world, San Jose-ish. And he can't find reliable internet to get on our podcast. That's definitely advanced. I think he's just busy eating peanuts and drinking beer at the bar, right? More likely. Yeah. Not that Pe- Alan does what? either Pe- of those things. Oh, but peanuts. Peanuts. Sorry. Peanuts. P e a n u t z. Peanuts. Wrong bar, Josh. Uh, <laughs> Wait, is he? Where is he? He is Bay at the area. Flash Media Summit. Which is exactly as exciting as it sounds. In beautiful Santa Clara, California. Yeah, I think it's at the Santa Clara Convention Center, which is kind of a poop hole. But it's across the street from an amusement park. It is a, is it across the, the street from Great America? And down the street from the 49ers Stadium. And, yeah, and the new 49ers Stadium. Alan, or Ken and I went to the Santa Clara Convention Center to go to the... What was the name of that show? It was like the Arcade Expo, like Pinball and Arcade Expo. California Extreme. California Extreme, yeah. Ken and I went there two or three years ago, something like that. I'd also been there once for Arm Tech Con. Uh, it, that convention center does not have very many redeeming qualities. It is old. It is kind of run down. Uh, but I bet it has internet. I bet it has internet. Alan's probably listening to us right now live, thinking, damn it, they know. They know. Anyway, uh, let's get on to the show this week. First of all, thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you're watching us live, we do record the show live. Uh, well, we always record the show live. We actually broadcast the recording live at pcpercom slash live at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on Wednesdays. And uh, you can uh, sign up for a little emailing list at pcpercom slash subscribe. If you go to that webpage, you get this little design here. It's like, hey, look, welcome to the mailing list, something, something, something. Uh, I think I need to zoom out one on that, don't I? No? 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 What do you think? No? Out. It's cutting off a little. Yeah. All right. Uh, so it all, all it does is ask for your name and your email address. We send you notifications, sometimes two hours, sometimes 45 minutes before the show starts. And and we're very close to reaching the 10,000 member mark for that mailing list. Now, if you sign up and you're the 10,000th member, you don't get crap. But it would be very exciting for me if we could cross the 10,000 <laughs> member mark. Uh, just for me personally. Just for a little bit of me. A little bit of me. Because he likes getting excited. And who doesn't? Yes. Uh, you know who, who you know who else got very excited this week, Josh? Um, the mattress people. Uh, well, for different reasons, yes. Emmeline. That's not she my daughter's excited. name. Reese. Reese got really excited. My daughter's name is Emmeline. Emmeline. Yeah. She's not super Reese? excited. Uh, she no. is in the hospital again, so she's probably yeah. not super excited. She's in there for a few more days. Having, I posted a picture on Facebook of like her attached to it was literally twelve wires like all across her chest. She was having a. Um, yeah, that's why they call it a 12 wire EKG. Is it actually 12 wires? I was just guessing. It's a, no, it's like 10 wire. It's a 10 wire. It's a EKG. lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the test was literally 15 seconds, right? Yeah. But they don't need much to get a trace. A whole lot of setup process of putting these stickers on a baby that is upset and mad and squirming and then attaching these wires to each of those stickers. Uh, she was not happy. And it looked very scary and daunting for something that lasted 20 seconds. And it's a completely passive test. Right, they're not like sending electroshock through her. At least I hope they weren't. I guess I don't know. I wasn't. Well, has she been a bad girl? Uh, she has been keeping us up a lot. So, well, yes. Then you need to do the electroshock therapy. Yeah, yep. and then she okay. she went through like a forty minute echocardiogram today as well, checking on her heart, doing a whole bunch of stuff here before they start uh, administering some medication. Uh, but we'll follow up on that. My I got to go back to the hospital later tonight or tomorrow anyway. So. Um, Anyway, who else got excited this week? Bill S. Bill S. did. Bill S. Preston Esquire. Was the winner of the full Gigabyte X99 and Core i7-5960X PC, uh, sponsored by Gigabyte and Kingston and Thermaltake. Um, now, I will be honest with you guys. There's still a chance that Bill S. does not get this machine because Bill S. has not replied to my email. Ooh. You fool. So, Bill S., I hope you gave me the right email address. Otherwise, you're going to be very disappointed if uh, it turns out that like you've typed in, you fudged the email, you think you didn't have to, you didn't want to give them your real email address, which sounds really stupid. But that's the only way of contacting somebody for winning like a twenty. What is it? How much was it? 
thirty. He's probably a fifteen-year-old kid PC. from Morocco, and so he's not. You know, he can't have it. I will say his address was listed, or he didn't. They don't list the address, but state of residence, California. Oh. So, in theory, he sh- Bill S. You know who you are, Bill. Should be very excited about winning this PC. If he doesn't, then everybody else can be really excited because we're going to draw another winner uh, before the next week's podcast. So, and actually, we just fit, kind of finished putting touches on it, getting it back together. We had to borrow a couple of parts, uh, but don't worry, it's all functional, it's all working. Oddly, it's using an Asus SLI bridge for some reason, and I, I like the SLI bridge that comes with the uh, motherboard. Didn't I don't know. It's very odd. And we just went through this thing where we looked through an Asus X99 board and an Asus Z97 board, and they didn't come with SLI bridges either? Is that there right? was one of the one connector short in the like, Z97. Like back-to-back yeah. cards. Like not for one that leaves uh, one Correct. gap space between it, which is what yeah. we needed. It's, it was, it's all very odd. But anyway, congratulations to Bill, maybe. And maybe congratulations to somebody else if Bill decides not to answer. Let's get to reviews and content. Josh, you Me? posted a review this week. Yes, I did. It was of the Zotac GTX 970 amp! Exclamation point. Uh, that's a video card, right? Core edition. Yes. yes Extreme it's, uh, core edition. It's a long name. It is. And it's a long card. Ooh. This is when I start singing Here Comes Mr. Bill's Dog on my video screen. Okay. Okay, but you're not showing me. Oh, oh, I see. Look at the size of... There appears to be three yes. fans on it. Lord. Okay. It's it's Zotac. So in the past couple of years, I've seen some Zotac products. Not in here except for maybe one. And it was a GTX 580. And it was their edition of it, but really it was just a reference edition with the Zotac sticker. Now they did something kind of interesting in that they partnered with Ace Tech and got a liquid cooling system for a more top high-end card. But that was about the of what they would do with design. They'd take the reference, they'd maybe put a couple of stickers on, overclock it a bit, call it good. Well, they've, they've kind of changed the way they're doing things. Instead, they're actually making and designing their own cards with their own cooling solutions, and so they've got this monstrosity. Now, last year they had like the Omega Edition and some of these others that were, you know, really tall cards, big PCBs, more along the lines of the MSI... Uh, uh, Lightning Series or the Asus Matrix, but I think they found that they were not nearly as popular because they had such a high price tag, and so they mm. experimented with what they call the the Core Series, and so it's a little bit more simple. As you see, it doesn't have you know extended PCB, it doesn't have the big overclocking chips uh, that you know provide more power to the GPU. And, you know, much more expensive, uh, bigger cooling. Instead, they, they kind of scaled it down. And they still have a product that is designed by them. It's overclocked heavily. But it doesn't cost a huge amount more than a reference design or some of the other more basic designs. Now, I have a uh, MSI 970 that was one of their cheaper ones that they built. And it was, uh, you know, and I bought this um, some time ago. As we can see, the... <laughs> kind of extreme amount of difference of, of size between these guys. And uh, this is more of a reference type PCB. And so you can see that, you know, since it's got a lot more stuff on it in terms of components and the cooling with the triple fans and the pretty hefty heat sink. And one thing that I've got to say about this is they don't make a heat sink that is like two and a half um, slots wide. So this will fit in nicely with an SLI. Oh, I see. Of, uh, You're saying it doesn't extend into the third slot, right? It doesn't exactly. Call it like yeah, yeah. like some of the other ones that uh, you'll f- see, like you know, some sapphire ones. They, they've got an extra quarter inch in there that will actually go in. But this is you know perfectly in line. In fact, a little bit shorter than you know the 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 two slot um, yeah. card thing. So. Uh, it is, again, overclocked heavily out of the box. Uh, performance was very good. Uh, I know that a lot of people are, are kind of disappointed the 970 with the 3.5 gigabyte slash 4 gigabyte of, of space. But mm-hmm. in terms of my testing, you know, I think and the card performs exactly about what you would expect in terms of price. Um, I used it in triple monitor setups, and I didn't notice chugging, slowdowns. 
anything like that. It it was a very very well behaved card, performance wise. It didn't outperform the more menially clocked MSI nine seventy by any huge extent. I mean, we had a couple of frames per second here and there, but it was one, two, maybe three percent uh, increase in performance. It was always consistently faster and did have consistently higher minimum frame rates than the other, but it, it didn't blow the other one out of the water, even though it, again, is, is clocked quite a bit higher than uh, the other more, you know, kind of basic generic MSI card that, that I showed it with. But where this really excels at is the build quality is fantastic. It is an incredibly solid card. I mean, it just doesn't flex. You put it in there. You don't see any bend whatsoever. It's got a really nice back plate that does act like a heat sink because, uh, you know, I put my, uh, my temperature uh, laser on there, and this was hitting 64, 65 C. So it gets pretty toasty. Yeah. How, and, and that's at load. Um, sure. At idle, this thing measured at the GPU was about, I think, 28C, which if you think my room is running 24, 25C at most, um, it just doesn't heat up. At, at load, it was hitting, I think, 68C. So it's an extremely cool card. As, as you well know, the uh, GTX 970 Maxwell part doesn't pull a whole lot of, of power anyway. I think it's uh, officially a 149-watt TDP part. And uh, even with the overclock and the 2x6 PCI uh, adapters, I mean, it can have potentially 225 watts pulled to it. And, uh, you know, it was just really cool running. It was quiet. Even though it was three fans, they're just all three spinning pretty slowly. Even at load, I could never hear it outside of the case that I had it installed in. Um, you know, in terms of just look... It's a it's a neat looking card. You can't maybe see it on my um, monitor or on my video, but it's got little you know carbon fiber throughout. And whether or not that's real carbon fiber, which I'm pretty sure it's not, uh, it still looks kind of cool. Uh, it's got a LED Zotac sign that lights up Ooh. when uh, it's powered up. I mean, it's it's a sharp looking card. It's got the you know kind of new you know single DVI. Uh, Three display port, one HDMI, and uh, what's the debate? I mean, the debate is: is this HDMI 2.0? There have been people who have said no, but yes. Sotax says it's HDMI 2.0. What do you... it is? It is. We we've, okay. we've plugged into HDMI 2.0 displays, and mm -hmm. it's gone 60 hertz 444. Okay, so the, then the, the debate you... is on Kepler cards. They use HDMI 1.4 to do 60 hertz at like 420. Yeah, oh, okay. they kind of fudge so it. that's that's what a lot of people are remembering when they see that. Okay, but anyway, it's it's then it's HDMI 2.0, and we're all very, very happy about it. Uh, in terms of overclocking, it wasn't fantastic. It was already clocked up pretty high. I was able to get about 30, 40 more megahertz with just some you know basic tweaking, um, you know, kind of a higher power envelope in the tweaking mod, and it. I've heard other samples going higher, and I just kind of had the luck of the draw that my sample didn't want to go much more than that. And that's perfectly fine because, again, it's clocked at a point where it probably is about at a GTX 980 level in terms of performance. And that's, that's a big positive for the money you spend. It's about 369 bucks online. You'll find it maybe cheaper or more for you know, depending on where you're at and where you're shopping and what specials. But see, Zotac has really impressed me with uh, the build quality, the design, how quiet it is, and, and how fast it is out of the box. So, uh, you know, I, I gave this a Silver Star Award. Well, whatever your Silver Award is, not a star. The Silver Star! Silver Star! And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I've been quite happy with uh, with what this has been able to do, but as long as you got room in your case, because it's a long card. Get out of my face! I don't. We don't. We don't need to see that. Right? No. Uh, yeah. If you want to see the benchmarks, and everything, go to the PCPer.com website. It's a great website. Uh, check out the rest of that review. Thanks, Josh, for that riveting report. Riveting on the Zotac. You know, I did that all in one breath. Yeah, yeah. You Pretty should much. see him swim, guys. It's amazing. 
It's amazing. Do we have to? Uh, <laughs> he wears a swim shirt, so it's not as okay. bad as you might think. I mean, I mean, right, Josh? You wear a long sleeve swim shirt, right? Just don't get me in a hot tub. Oh boy, you that's, don't uh, know. that's you, commando territory. You don't want to know what happens beneath the bubbles. No, <laughs> but he can hold his breath an awful long time. <laughs> oh dear lord! Uh, so the next question we have for everybody. I don't know if we had a previous question, honestly, but the next question is what exactly is a draw call and what can it do? This is an interesting topic that I am glad Scott decided to basically write a short editorial about because as we see the release of Windows 10 and all of this information or out there about, hey, DirectX 12 is way more efficient. You can do way more draw calls per second on DX12 on the same CPU um, on the same processor performance levels than you could on even the multi-threaded DirectX 11 implementation. So uh, he went in and kind of dives into what a draw call is, what it can do, what some potential benefits are of it. You know, he, he goes through and references um, our previous benchmarks using the 3D Mark API overhead feature test, uh, which was, when was that? That was a couple months ago, right? March, I guess it was, kind of right after GDC. Uh, and you can see here, like if you look at DirectX 11 versus Mantle or DX12, like the you're getting an order of magnitude or more better uh, scaling with draw call capability uh, on these CPUs, right? So here's uh, the GTX 980, again increasing order of magnitude improvement there. So the real question is, is like, what do you do? with all of that performance, right? And, and and this is something I think people need to understand is as we get more and more information about how many draw calls you can render per second and, and how much, you know, it's six times better on uh, vendor A and it's five and a half times better on vendor B, it's important to realize like this stuff right here that performance differences are going to be significantly lower than what those those draw call scaling rates really are. Right, in terms of what your delivered performance is actually going to be. Where you get some interesting um, possibilities is what game developers maybe do with that extra overhead, right? So if you take an existing game structure converted to DX12, you're gonna see maybe 10% performance improvement. If you don't change anything drastically because of the API overhead reduction, if you fundamentally do things like uh, the Oxide Engine and the game uh, Ashes of Singularity from Stardock, I think is what it's called. Um, you know, they they at GDC talked with us about you know what we what we want to do is we wanted to have you know huge numbers of units on uh, a playing field of a real time strategy game all at the same time, and having these additional draw calls improves that. But it's not going to improve it by a level of five or six X. There's still bot other bottlenecks in the system, whether it be GPU render rates or whatever, um, that, that need to be met with that. Now you could sidestep some of that if you kind of simplify the look and style uh, and graphical fidelity of some of those units maybe, right? And you kind of, again, you're you're essentially doing what we have done in the past with CPU reviews where you lower the uh, resolution of the game in order to put more pressure on the CPUs. You could do that and then theoretically show uh, better scaling and improvement there. And so uh, Scott talks a little bit about that and how that might work. Uh, sorry, I'm scrolling the wrong way here. Uh, and he also uh, had an interesting discussion where he asked uh, a developer about, you know, will this make the asset creation part of game design a little bit easier? Because rather than trying to uh, make more complicated shaders or uh, more complicated, you know, uh, on the fly geometric creations and try to work them all into as few of draw calls as possible. If you can kind of be, you know, sloppy about it, if you will, and just, you know, pass out draw calls more quickly because of the API difference, uh, that it may actually lead to improvements in, you know, uh, either improved visual fidelity because of that access or uh, the ability to kind of create more content in a l uh, lower amount of time, which will obviously save a lot of money in terms of development resources and, and things of that nature. Um, and he also kind of goes on here to reference the um, uh, Assassin's Creed Unity issue where, you know, there was, some people were saying it was pushing upwards of 50,000 draw calls per second or per frame, I don't remember which, which, which it was. Uh, and that was kind of the issue of the performance hit that you know people saw across the board really in Assassin's Creed Unity. Um, it'd be interesting to, 
I don't think anybody will talk about this, this, this recently, but, you know, get some kind of like postmortem on that development and, and see what really happened. And if they're like, if they can say, convert this over to DX12 and like fundamentally see an immediate change in, in, in performance and scaling capability, I don't know if that will be the case. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually a very good editorial. I encourage you guys to go read it uh, that, that Scott put up there. And he, his basic conclusion is the improvement in draw call performance on, on a CPU and an API structure uh, is not going to be free performance. Uh, but it does free up performance for future development if these guys use it in the appropriate way. So again, just like, you know, I tried to calm down everybody saying, but, oh, upgrade to Windows 10, you're gonna get this automatic performance boost. There was some because of the WDDM uh, driver model changing, um, which is not like saying the ATM machine, I guess. Uh, but, you know, it, just fundamentally converting a game, you know, rendering, uh, going, uh, downloading Unreal Engine 4 and then hitting the uh, attack DX12 API on your um, on your compile isn't going to suddenly give you a 5x fold performance improvement in really any area. So um, temper you mean expectations. You actually have to develop for a DirectX version to yep. get the most out of it. Temper your expectations. Shocking. And I say that knowing that there are a couple of things coming down the pipeline uh, in terms of you know similar similar to what we saw at the DirectX. Uh, what was it, the, the API overhead test from 3D Mark, where it showed these huge differences. And I think that's kind of what started people saying, oh my God, Windows 10 and DirectX 12 are going to be this huge fundamental performance boost right away. And it's just not going to be the case. It may be a huge fundamental performance increase, but it will not be uh, right away. So check out uh, Scott's uh, story on that. Now I think we need to get to really the flagship story of the week without the cutting a cutting edge product i mean it you have done a it's video clearly about. like it's time to talk about a new player in the discrete graphics market they came out of nowhere didn't they they did that like all of a sudden uh i got uh, not anonymously sent uh, one of these cards, I like. I didn't think it was much. I sat on it for a while, kept it in the packaging and everything for for some time, and then it got uh, peed on by the condo above us and their water leak, and so we decided to go ahead and do an unboxing. I am, of course, referring to 3DFX, one of the. I don't want to say one of the greatest graphics companies that ever existed, but like in my mind, it is right. That they, they did certainly the, Larry. They did the SLI thing, right? Like they kind of brought that into the fold. Um, and it, it, this was a sad day for me to have to do. It may be the last time I opened a 3DFX graphics card. Uh, I am I, I'm talking about the 3DFX Voodoo 3 2000 PCI graphics card, a GPU with 16 megs of memory, 16 megabytes, megabytes of memory. I believe it ran at 124 megahertz. Um, and it was passively cooled, as you can see here. You know... It, and it has one VGA output, which this photo doesn't really show very well, but that's what it has. I looked at this card a lot, and Ken and I were kind of joking around. It's like, you kind of feel like two things came to mind. All right here, I'll show some of this unboxing video here. Uh, two things come to mind. One is, have we gone backwards in graphics card technology that we require 250, 350, 500 watt coolers on some of these GPUs when this was... Not a flagship, but a mid-range card being passively cooled by a heatsink that looks like it came off of a Pentium 386 or something. Uh, and then the it's second one of those Southbridge yeah heatsinks yeah. And then the second question I had was, what would people at 3DFX engineers had been able to do had they known that in the not too distant future users would be accepting of a card that draws 250 to 300 watts of power. Well, if you notice one thing, I mean, it is PCI, which is a maximum of 25 watts that it can pull through the slot. Yep. Yeah. 25 watts. And you think the 750Ti is efficient. So, I mean, this is like, we were talking about... Uh, 
order of magnitude differences. This is an order of magnitude difference, right? Like we're looking at um, 25 watts versus 250 watts. Did I speed it up? No. I think the video might be going through the network not very well. Figured yeah. you were just really excited. Yeah. Um, so you can see there, I'm like taking the I'm taking the packaging off of it. It had a thirty dollar mail in rebate on it that I'm going to send to Brian Burke uh, as well. Was I, I'm hoping he'll he'll still honor he'll still honor the rebate. So we opened it up. We we went through like the little funny unboxing process, and then I was like, okay, you know, can we actually get this card to work? There's Brian Burke. Uh, can we can we get this? this video card to work. So we had to go find a motherboard that had a PCI slot, which, you know, they make Z97 or Z87 boards that, that have PCI, Z170 boards that have PCI. We, we had to go back to a Sandy Bridge platform for our, for our use case. We use a Sandy Bridge processor. Um, we uh, did, uh, we had to find Windows XP. We had to find an optical drive because we couldn't get it to boot off of a thumb drive uh, to Windows XP. But to find an optical drive, we had to find a, a, a blank DVD to, to burn the ISO to, uh, and then we had to bring it up. By the way, installs go really fast on, uh, on an SSD, like when you're installing the game. It, apparently, it didn't go very fast with Windows XP, but go ahead, Ken. Well, you're loading it off the optical drive. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're installing it from an optical drive to an SSD, so it kind of it, it's a little sad feeling. Um, so we got that up and running, had to find some drivers. So as it turns out, like the community of 3DFX fans have been maintaining drivers up through Windows XP. Keep in mind, this card, the Voodoo 3 2000 came out in 1999. And we found a driver from 2007 that had been updated for Windows XP support. And we I got think that. DX8. DirectX 8 support I think on so. it. Uh, so we, you know, we, we got that. We installed it. It was fine. I had to go find uh, an Unreal Tournament Game of the Year edition, 1999. ISO of that because Steam just blue screened uh, the machine when we tried to install it on there over and over again. So I had to install from an ISO there, but man, that install goes fast. Uh, again, like copying the ISO to an SSD um, and booted up and played. I mean, let me bring this up here. We got to play some Unreal Tournament Game of the Year Edition in Glide. So here's the system running. Uh, it passively cooled there. And then uh, here is uh, Ken playing a little bit of UT Game of the Year edition on that on that beast. On a CRT, by the way. We did. We also had an issue where the VGA card, trying to get into the installer, was like cutting off half the screen so we couldn't see any of the options on our Dell 3008, like 30-inch 2560 by <laughs> 1600 monitor. So we had to go get the one CRT um, that I believe is like a, what is that, a 15 inch? It's a 17 inch. Oh, it was a 17. It's like Ooh, 1280 no. by 800. Yeah, 1280 by 1024. Okay. 1280 yeah. by 800. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not thinking the right aspect ratio. That CRT came from the closet at my parents' house. That, I, that was my CRT. I have some really nice CRTs in my basement still, but they weigh 100 pounds, so I don't want to bring <laughs> them in. Um, with, I tried to run Fraps. I was like, ah, oh, let's run some benchmarks. This will be funny. Fraps doesn't like uh old dx anymore or windows xp or glide you didn't use the built-in no benchmark no, I, I, I thought about it but also i i will point out i i switched back to like the software renderer turns out sandy bridge processor is pretty good at software rendering uh <laughs> the unreal tournament engine so <laughs> There's a little bit of a graphical like lighting difference and stuff, but uh, like frame rate wise, the Sandy Bridge CPU did just fine compared to the Voodoo 3 2000 PCI. So uh, Mark was right about that. What's that? Rendering going. I just remember uh, the Epic guy. What's his name? Mark Rain. Mark Rain. No. no. Yeah. Now the uh, Tim Sweeney? programmer. Sweeney. Tim yep. Sweeney. My brain, it's going down. It hurts. That uh, very famously said, uh, you know, we're going to move away from from GPUs and all the performance is going to go back to CPUs, so we'll have one thing. So in this case, he's absolutely correct. I mean, he was 16 years off. And yeah, and, and kind of a ways off in, in what the state of art would be today. But, yeah. you know, we'll give him that. Yeah. So this was, it was fun. Um, actually, I got the cards in right here. I guess I could have held it up. Uh, it's, just, it's just interesting to look at this. So this you, the one and only time I've ever touched a 3dfx graphics card i need wow. to i need to bring in like if we've got that xp do we still have that ssd or do you format it i think it's still over here like i've got like voodoo 2 sli cards <laughs> and stuff i don't know how much 
Like if we go back to that driver page and see what they actually kept support for through Windows XP, I don't feel like going anything below Windows XP. Yeah, I've I've got a K six two plus downstairs with two Voodoo twos and SLI running on I think Windows ninety five a Voodoo three three thousand. No, no, it wasn't. Is it? Or maybe it's one of these and it's shrink wrap bobs. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. but wait, you can't run a Voodoo 3 with two Voodoo 2s in SLI. You, you can't. Well, you can't use you both at the same time. You had this little utility. You had this little, little utility called 3D Switcher. <laughs> Sounds, and, I bet I know what it does. And it, it, you, you choose which cards render the 3D game. Yeah, okay, so you could use one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Because you could actually SLI these as well if you had more than one. Mm, yep. No. I think so. No. I think so. I think if you go back and look, I think so. Uh, is is there a connector on there? No, there's not. I've never run Voodoo 3 in SLI. You can actually yeah, see it. Was, you can actually see physical connector on the cards. back. Voodoo 2 was the last SLI card yeah. until they did the VSA 100. And then you could only SLI them when they were a full card like this. And you couldn't do I can see two of these to do quad SLI. You needed to buy the non-existent 6,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, it did exist, but it was never sold, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that the four GPU card? Yes. With like uh, the tiny ass, like server great, like server fans. Yes, and they have yep. the four pen Molex providing extra power that the what fifty watt AGP couldn't provide. See, this is what we're saying. Imagine what the what they would have done with right. a magical two hundred watt. Also, card. by the way, I would say that the MSRP GPUs on it. The MSRP of this Voodoo three two thousand uh, was one hundred twenty nine dollars, <laughs> and this was a mid range card, adjusted for inflation. That's one hundred eighty six dollars. So, uh, there you go, there you go. So, uh, check out that video if uh, if you're interested in it. It's pretty funny. It's our first 4K video. Yeah, it's also uh, the first video we <laughs> shot in 4K, which is ironic, as Josh pointed out before the show started, that we recorded uh, the first video we recorded in 4K is on a product that was not capable of actually handling the resolution that we recorded. I think this only goes up to 2048 by 1536 or something like that. If that, yes. Yeah, yeah I yeah, it's got the RAM DAC. To it do says that. on the box. It's a 300 it megahertz RAM DAC. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, if you watch the video, you can learn a little bit about the controversy that surrounded the Voodoo 3 graphics card and its 22-bit uh, color quality. Interesting stuff. Dithered, dithered output. So interesting. All right, let's move on to some other crap. Uh, starting with this, actually occurred at Skylake launch, but uh, Alan drug his feet a little bit getting his news post up. Intel did officially announce the SSD 750 series 800 gigabyte SKU. If you remember, this is the NVMe PCI Express SSD uh, that Intel introduced April, maybe, I guess, March or April, something like that. And they released a 400 gig model and a 1.2 terabyte model. And immediately we said, looking at the performance, this is awesome, but the pricing was odd because you had a $380 part at 400 gigs and then you had like a $1,000 part at 1.2 terabytes, and this kind of 400 gig is, is probably okay, but it's it's on the low side of SSDs maybe now, especially if you're looking at something this fast and this, you know, kind of if you're willing to pay close to a dollar per gig. An 800 gig model was really like where we thought a lot of people would be interested in it. So they seem to have responded with that, and with the Skylake announcement, they did announce an 800 gig version of the SSD 750. We don't have pricing. We don't have available... What? It's what? on Newegg right now. Oh, how much is it selling for? Uh, 750. Okay, I, my guess was seven thirty nine. Yeah, seven forty nine ninety nine. You can buy it right now. So it's seven forty nine ninety nine. Okay. The so two it, and a half inch form factor is seven twenty nine ninety nine. It's cheaper for the two and a half U uh, dot two. Yeah. Variant. I think less people will be interested in that than the PCIe version. Buy but a new shiny Skylake board. Breaking news. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so now you can get the eight hundred gig version of it for seven hundred and fifty bucks. Uh, where's that put it? Uh, let's see, 750 divided by 800. That's 93 cents per gig. I think that's right in line with the 1.2 terabyte drive. Um, so there you go. Now, it actually, it showed up on arc.intel.com. Uh, it was in the Sandy Bridge briefing data. So, I like. Yeah, what did I say? Sandy Bridge. It was not in the Sandy Bridge <laughs> briefing data. It was definitely it in the Skylake briefing details. Uh, but there you go. So, um, and now that you can use Z170 boards to RAID 
two drives. You could buy two 400s and raid zero of them, or you could buy two 800s and raid zero of them, although I would really just get one drive, because let's be real. That's all you need. Uh, but very cool nonetheless. Uh, Alan's not here, as we already discussed. There's a couple of things from Flash Media Summit we'll, we'll touch on here. I don't know if anybody else has anything that they want to point out. Apparently, Samsung announced 256 gigabit VNAND. What is that uh, compared to what it was previously? Anybody remember? It was 128-bit uh, for the TLC stuff. Otherwise, cut that by, what, a third? Yeah. For the regular uh, stuff, like in the 850... Uh, Pro and the 128 was in the Evo. Yeah. So this stuff is now double that. So you can get big drives. I'm yeah, kind of I mean, curious. Did he mention if if they lowered the process node and then you know obviously they they stacked they stacked it all higher. It's like set of 32. I don't think they changed layers. It's 48. Node, no, I think similar to when Intel was announcing their 3D. And it was going to be built at the same process because they're just going vertical. Yeah, but this is much more efficient than their previous stuff. I mean, significantly more power efficient. So I'm not seeing anything in his story here that mentions any process node. Um, because if you look at this slide, they're talking about new higher capacity dyes, but no, not that they're getting more dyes per wafer. Uh, they're just stacking Eight, higher. 1.4x more density per wafer. Yeah. Because they're stacking higher, not because they're making lower process node and thus smaller dies, right? I don't know. Those squares look yeah, smaller. Yeah, look, look at the picture. The squares. But, but he smaller. definitely says, yeah. in like, uh, realize that this does not mean more dies per wafer, oh. as the image incorrectly oh, suggests. Well. Oh well, I guess that it helps then. if I read the text. Yeah, sometimes you got to read text. Alan doesn't. <laughs> Alan doesn't write a whole lot of it, so you got to read it so you get all the nuance. <laughs> Um, but what all this means is more capacity, more drives, right? I mean, like we're talking here, 16 terabyte uh, enterprise level SSDs, right? But still 16 terabyte SSDs. And then apparently they're already rolling this out into the 850 Evo, which I think is kind of odd. It's like, remember that issue where, who, who did that before? Was it Kingston or somebody? that they Well, sort of. Sort of, where they, it was another company that did Kingston this. Kingston and PNY changed controllers. Wasn't there somebody else that just changed Flash? Maybe it was OCZ PNY that changed Flash. I don't know. Instead. But they changed Flash halfway through, and it kind of affected performance. Now, Samsung says that they're changing from uh, the, 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 the lower capacity dies to the higher capacity dies, even with the same capacity total solid-state drive, that it won't affect performance. Alan says he's going to get some samples in to um, you know, spot-check that and make sure that there aren't any changes in that regard. But this basically allows them to lower prices and thus, hopefully, lower prices. Allows them to lower costs, and hopefully it means that they'll lower prices and not just keep all that money for themselves. Ugh. Um, what else did he have? Toshiba announced QLC. I did not read this at all. Anybody read this? Jeremy, did you spot check this at all? I, I took a quick look at it, and it sort of shows that you shouldn't really call it TLC because it's actually 3-bit MLC because now we've got quadruple-level cell bits. For everyone that's going to poo-poo the MLC immediately off the bat, well, that, that is up to you. But for lowering costs, it's definitely the way to go. They're talking more about uh, perhaps not consumer level, but uh, long-term storage. Although, if you're able to afford flash for your long-term storage, you're doing pretty damn well. But uh, so it's not going to get a lot of usage. Again, one of the drawbacks of having a uh, four-bit MLC or three-bit MLC for that matter. <coughs> Excuse me. But it would certainly make sense, uh, like I say, for a big, inexpensive drive that's just going to hold a lot of data and not really change all that much, just be read. Hmm. Yeah. I, 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 some of, a lot of this stuff goes over me, but hey. Three-bit MLC, three bit TLC. Yeah, okay. Toshiba, go. Hey, you know, you know who who's owned by Toshiba? That can OCZ. use that can use a little like shot in the arm in terms of getting technology up and running first and putting out products that are interesting and exciting. Yeah, I, didn't I say OCZ? You did, but you didn't wait for me to really finish my. Hey, OCZ. Thank you. Yes, correct. <laughs> correct. Um. Uh. 
So let's talk about Skylake again. This uh, we talked about last week. It came out early last week. It is uh, not maybe available. I don't. I don't even know. Is it? Uh, did anybody check to see? I'm the gonna... i five is available, and I think we're still waiting on i seven availability. So the sixty six hundred k is available, and the sixty seven. Yeah, you can get it for two forty nine at Newegg, yes. and it was out of stock when I looked on Amazon. That's very frustrating because we were definitely told specifically the opposite of that by Intel. Yeah. They already did this launch in kind of an odd fashion by bringing uh, releasing the product reviews before the architecture reveal. Uh, that will be at IDF next week. Um, and now saying that the processors are going to be widely available at launch and then not be widely available at launch is pretty crappy. So, uh, I mean, it doesn't make it a less good part when it does eventually show up as long as it shows up at the price we expected. And somebody else doesn't come up with some magical part otherwise. Uh, but maybe more interesting is this story that Scott posted for us that shows somebody deliting it. It's not Mori. Uh deleting deleting Skylake. Because they actually did it successfully. Right. Oh, there was no crack. Don't, don't be mean to Mori. Well that that we know well, of. Yeah. It was the custom wrench that did it. I mean where they found a <laughs> wrench that says T D P I'm not quite sure. Got to keep that thermal dissipation down. So this is an, I actually like this shot right here. All right. So this is showing you the um uh, I believe that's Skylake on the left. Right. The thickness of the substrate yeah. as compared to yeah. no, a Skylake is the thinner it has one. Haswell is on the right, and it's yeah, one, yeah. One, that's one, what I meant. I meant Skylake's the thinner one. Yeah. Uh, which also means that if they're the same height, that means that the heat spreader on Skylake is bigger. Yes. By default, I don't know. If it doesn't need to be necessarily. Well, they kind of need to if they want the same mountain mounting mechanisms. Right. I mean, they don't need to uh, heat dissipation wise. Would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Right, they sure. didn't have to do it for thermal reasons. Um, so if I read Chinese as I do, Japanese um, of Japanese, yes, clearly, yes. See, I knew that. Uh, what is this telling me? It's telling you that when you replace the rather crappy thermal paste under the heat spreader with something a lot better, mm. and if I'm looking here, he used. Oh, I see, Prolimatech. Limitech PK3, PK3. Cool laboratory liquid pro. Man, that sounds awesome. I bet it's expensive. Far, far those better attempt. Re those results? Yeah. <laughs> it's liquid that. metal. <laughs> Wait, didn't I, I find one that of since the T1000? Remember, didn't we? F we found a, a a cooling interface from Main Gear yeah. that was called T1000. Yeah, and it was a liquid metal. And I don't know what I did with it. Irony. Yeah. I think it was mostly evaporated. No, what it had evaporated was the stuff that you used to clean the processor ah. before applying it. Uh, and here is a picture of the Skylake processor delitted. A very small die right there. Um, but 20 I, I think, degree delta is pretty yeah, insane. Yeah, reducing it from 88C to 68C is huge. If only they had like a higher end skew for 30 bucks more that they sold with like 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 um satan's canyon <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't it won't be devil's canyon it'll be satan's canyon i don't know I satan guess. uh so that's 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 pretty cool stuff I, I just i like this picture here this is like you probably you probably shouldn't do this on your own probably shouldn't do that it, it looks like some kind of sadomasochism bondage thing gone wrong yeah and why they didn't break that substrate with that kind of pressure i just don't know you don't know that they didn't i guess on several that's, that's they true. Got <laughs> to work. micro fractures uh yeah or how long it maybe would survive uh going forward but uh pretty neat stuff pretty neat stuff sky lake delated all right next on the list uh is this the gtx 950 jeremy you tell me this fancy robot, is that the GTX 950? Yes, indeed it is. It, it uh, actually starts to power up and play your games for you if you buy the extended edition. Ooh, I don't want that. But, yeah, uh, once again, one of the, our great uh, Leak Friends video cards. Video, no, you, didn't, you didn't say it right. Try again. Video cards. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, found some pictures of a PNY GeForce GTX and 950. 
which, as we've sort of heard in previous rumors, is about 75% of a GM206 Maxwell card. So you trim down to 768 CUDA cores on a 128-bit bus with 2 gigs of memory. They also found it for sale on a site in Finland, and we're pretty sure that that price is completely and totally baked because it's not going to be 281 euro. It, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's in uh, Finland. It's not too close to England, but not too far from Japan. From Japan. Yeah. Such a long way from China. Lots of yeah. miles from Vietnam. Sure. And they have the GTX 950. So we know it's going to be a card. We don't know that the specs we're telling you are going to be exactly right, but we could consider it an informed guess. And no idea if there is going to be a TI version or not. It would make sense, at least to me. And... I don't know, it's probably going to be the same price zone as, what, a 280? But will it have that sweet GTX 560-style cooler when it comes out? Not according to the picture. Is that what that looks like to you? Okay. I thought the yeah, 650 was, and 750 were both a lot shorter. Uh, the, 750 the 750 and 750 Ti were, were very short. Yeah. But and I think some of them didn't Josh? even require power connectors, so... Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was the, the interesting thing, thing about uh, this is, uh, you know, the 750, 750 Ti made its, uh, made its money on saying, hey, we don't need a power connector. This one looks like it's got one. Oh, no. Oh, no. I need an extra 75 watts for my card. Think of the overclocking <laughs> headroom. You do on that. I don't know what to say. Uh, I can't say anything on this, but hey, good. Francois says that we news. can buy a 6700K on Newegg. Is he selling him? No, we can't. Cyber pa- no, you, you have to do Cyber Power PC desktop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Get a 6700K. Right. You know what? And here's, what? Here's what I say about that. Is I, when does that actually ship? That would be my next question. Because today. It ships not, today. They're not yep. stocking those at the warehouse, like pre-built systems with the 6700K in them, Right. Yeah. I don't know. You'd Spend have to eighteen hundred and fifty bucks. You get a whole system with a free sixty-seven K. Or sixty-seven hundred. Just throw out the rest of the hardware. Take out that sixty-seven hundred K. Totally worth it for the upgrade. Thanks so much for the for the <laughs> cheat, Francois. Jeez. <laughs> All right. Uh, how about this? Are you tired of using graphical interfaces to overclock? Your graphics card, Sebastian You're supposed has to it. say that in the, the, the big game show. Are you tired of owning graphical interfaces without... Come on, do it. Think um, of the precision of text input. If you understand the language, no, you can control every aspect of this Come card. on. You got you to have like an armful of limes, right? And, and, and like, you drop uh, them all on the floor. You drop them all and like it hit your mouse and the mouse moved something on your... Um, uh, Gooey for your overclock, and it and took next the thing power you know, your, from hundred. You burst and flame. Yeah, it's a two hundred and fifty percent, and then it immediately caught fire. And then you're like, ah, oh, and then you can't find your fire extinguisher, and your house burns down. All because you used a visually stunning graphics card overclocking utility. Sebastian, tell me about this. What the hell are we talking about? Okay, so there was a user with an unpronounceable name that I won't even begin to re- it's uh, on a WordPress just site that Tupac. looks very sketchy. But basically, he, he says he went through and used a debugger to like pry into the assembly language on MSI Afterburner and look at what it was actually doing and what it was tapping into. And he said it was the NV API. So he created his own command line tool, basically, and he posts all the code and a link to the tool on his site. And I was looking in the comments, and they're basically saying this is the same thing as NVIDIA Inspector, which already exists. But it's kind of a command line version that he apparently created himself. And it's open but, source. Yeah. So it, it basically is taking some proprietary stuff. It to be. He shows you the code, which he claims you can use to um, uh, overclock anything, including the mobile cards. So even if you have the newest version of NVIDIA drivers presumably installed in your laptop, you can use this to overclock the... The mobile. I can't remember. So basically, the, the, the Linux console nerds who are forced to use Windows to play games <laughs> yes. can have a little bit of home <laughs> to go back yes. to with overclocking the card. I guess the advantage would be if it lets you overclock cards that otherwise would not be permitted. But I can't remember if the newest version of NVIDIA's uh, drivers 
still are blocking mobile overclocking. I thought they were again after a brief. I don't know the answer to that. Respite. So regardless, it's an interesting tool. You can also compare it against NVIDIA and Spectre, which has been around for a while. I'm trying to figure out if this view is more interesting or exciting to me in any capacity <laughs> for overclocking. Well, I mean, you could do a cool thing like create a bat file that steps it up by a megahertz every time and watch and log it. You know, it, it makes the readers very happy because they would, like, I'm sure, You could like make an auto overclocking tool in some degree like what Asus does with their motherboards. Yeah, you could just have it, like have 3D Mark running, kick it up a megahertz at a time, log it. Kick it up a if notch. If you thought my quad-core benchmark graphs were long, <laughs> wait until you see my latest experiment. One megahertz at a time, benchmarks in every game. Yeah, Just I'm for it. Charts of thousands. And yeah. you'll even share the source code so that people can do it for themselves at home. In fact, that's the only you way they're going to get these results. So <laughs> you know, if you don't go granular, go big. Or both. I wonder what... if this. I guess if this utility kind of already existed from NVIDIA in some capacity, I wonder what their... NVIDIA's stance is on, oh, hey, like all, like that, that WordPress page, if I go to it, like lists all of the NVAPI. Uh, Knowing how controlling NVIDIA is about stuff, I bet they're not, not very happy. Sad. Like, here's all of the uh, uh, data that you can access, right? Like, create display from an unattached display, get display port, you know, get DVC info, D3D queries. Um, Secrets of G Sync exposed. <laughs> And Good they, lord! You know we were just talking about 3D effects, and when I first overclocked my 3D effects card, I did it by console variables SST underscore whatever. Do you remember those days? No. I mean, do you really yep. like think this wouldn't be more useful than using trying to figure out the UI and Precision X when you're testing a graphics card? But See the UI and Precision, to? but the UIs are like it's so easy to me now. It, it's a pretty bad UI though. And you know you know exactly what you want to do. I do. So I do. I mean, I don't know, if, but like, I don't know. Overclock minus one hundred space zero. I don't. I don't know. You still gotta have documentation for it, right? Like You'd you still don't clicky, know. Clicky, 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 click, click, click. Yeah, click. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, that's. I think it's a pretty cool tool. So if you go to the website and uh, search for the uh, NV API story overclock any NVIDIA GPU on desktop and mobile with a new utility. You can uh, go find the WordPress page and download it or download the code yourself and mess around with it and see if you can break your system. That sounds exciting. Um, let's see what else we got. Upcoming Oculus SDK 0.7 integrates direct driver mode from AMD and NVIDIA. This is kind of interesting, right? So um, Oculus VR, very exciting stuff. Uh, we had, we had continued to hear about uh, what is now known as VRWorks, I believe, is that right? From NVIDIA. And Liquid VR from AMD. These are like specific campaigns and programs to get developers direct access to the GPU and, and kind of like lower latency, improve performance, do everything you can do to uh, basically improve the user experience in, in VR. And now the official Oculus SDK 0.7 will add support for the di uh, uh, not the direct driver mode into it, right? Which is built with partnership of NVIDIA and AMD. Uh, I think what they say here is it's the most robust and reliable solution for interfacing with the Rift to date. Rather than inserting VR functionality between the OS and the graphics driver, headset awareness is added directly to the driver. As a result, direct driver mode avoids many of the latency challenges of extended mode and also significantly reduces the number of conflicts between the Oculus SDK and third-party applications. Um, it does require new drivers, and they're also removing the extended mode, which is what I think a lot of the early applications utilized in order to kind of like get quickly up to speed and get... Uh, access to it, which are kind of just treated as a secondary display, right, Ken? It kind of just, I think Windows just saw it as a secondary display, and then it kind of handled the stuff on the side, but apparently that added in a lot of latency and complications, so that's going to go away. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting stuff. So this gives gives users a little bit better, or gives game developers, I guess I should say, more direct access to the VR headset. Uh, it should make things like VR works, GameWorks VR. Maybe it's just called GameWorks VR. I think that's maybe what it's called. And Liquid VR, like more easily accessible, uh, take advantage of, uh, of features like um, what is NVIDIA released with Maxwell uh, multi-res shading, 
right? Where you could change resolutions of different viewports to kind of lower the impact on the GPU, improve latency without affecting image quality. We've got a video in bed that's actually timed to start uh, when uh, Tom Peterson was here last for the 980, well, not for last, but for the 980 Ti launch, where we talk about GameWorks VR and what multi-res shading actually does. So you hopefully we'll be able to see that implemented in game engines and, and direct mode will kind of improve that. They also said, by the way, that going forward, every other SDK release will break two, two releases back. So when they release 0 0.8, only 0 0.8 and 0 0.7 will be supported. When they release 0 0.9, only 0 0.8 and 0 0.9 will be supported. Uh, that, that is a, an expectation of ramping up to the 1.0 release. So that means we're getting, we're getting there. We're getting there close. I can finally buy one of these things and see if it's going to work for me or not, or if I'm going to remain continuously vomitous. Uh, while while playing these games, so or at least maybe Everett. you know, take your shoes off and do a really awkward pose. <laughs> maybe like jump in the air and pretend to fly. Yeah. Yep. Man, the the fervor around that picture was amazing. And then when I was at the airport the other day and I saw the cover like on the newsstand, I did go, "Yeah, you know what? That's pretty bad." Like just like looking across a row of magazines, like yeah. Was, Way to go, time. It's not a great idea. I'm, I'm betting the founder, well, the, the inventor of the Oculus is pretty horrified now. Yeah. He's actually kind of said he doesn't really care. I, oh, well. I don't know if he doesn't care, but they're definitely playing it he, off that nobody cares. He's he's sitting on his Facebook millions. Yeah. So Billions, sir. Well, sure. Let's be honest, who reads time? I don't, but I didn't who see it at the time they're going to sell a gaming time. device. Just, just like when uh, I made a comment about USA Today cover, and Ken tweeted back to me, so oh, I can immediately tell you're at an airport. And I was like, yeah, I was. I was at an airport. <laughs> like, who else gets the USA Today except people who are at airports or hotels, right? Um, let's move on to the next story. Sebastian, you wrote this up, too. The R9 Fury, some of them can potentially be unlocked to a full Fury X. Is that right? That's right. Well, apparently, there was a thread already on Overclock.net for how to do this. There's a few downloads for tools. It's just in software. So... This user, Extreme Addict, is his name on HWBot. And Extreme so, Addictions is his game. It is. He is apparently addicted to doing terrible, terrible things to stock graphics cards. Really? Like, Kinda like performing you. surgery on them and little you know, wire leads and unlocking voltage. And He has complete instructions on how to do this, mostly through pictures. But apparently what he was able to achieve with this Asus Strix... Uh, R9 Fury, after unlocking it to the full compute units of a Fury X, he then took the HBM to a gigahertz. He doubled the speed of high bandwidth memory. Wow. And he took the core up 400 megahertz and was running uh, Firestrike Extreme and posting the results. And he got it up to a score of over 10,000 in Firestrike Extreme. That's when we look over your shoulder and say over... 9,000? What? So so there's two things of this, right? One is like you're unlocking it to uh, take advantage of more compute units. The other one is obviously the LN2 overclocking part of it. I think um, we ran this utility on one of our Fury cards here. Yeah. And Ken, what did, it, what did it show? It showed that you could you you could try to unlock it, but one of the cores was one of the compute units was yeah. like in the middle of it. Yeah, it was so, bad, so, so it was likely a faulty one. So, so like if if it, the the utility, I don't have a screenshot of it. The utility like shows you all your compute units um, per engine, right? Because I think there's four total engines, yeah. and then uh, like there's two compute units per engine disabled. And if all of those are at the end, like they're just the last ones in the line, then it tends to mean that, well, they just disabled them not because of uh, an actual limitation, but because they needed to make this part. And so you can try to do the unlocking that way. Whereas when we did it uh, in one of the engines, one of the compute units that was disabled was kind of in the middle of the list, indicating that actually that one was disabled probably because that compute unit had a fault in it or when it was enabled uh, caused issues with clocking or something like that, right? So it maybe was legitimately disabled as opposed to just disabled in order to bin for, you know, different SKUs that uh, AMD was selling. So but I, I think in theory we could have enabled the other compute units fully leaving those. It's odd. We could have, it's saying we could have maybe enabled 
seven out of the eight missing ones? I think so. I wonder what that would do, like this uneven, kind of unbalanced. He covered that system. a little bit in the article. The, the, oh, really? the original series of HW Bot posts, he talks about uh, unlocking just like, like one unit at a time, and he shows results actually with different segments enabled mm. and then all enabled. And I mean, what, I mean how what, did it scale? Yeah, was I mean, was it interesting? Is like, well, let's see. Uh, is that on the HW at bot? Two hundred twenty-four TMUs. He achieved sixty-two hundred and thirty-seven in Fire Strike Extreme. Then he moved up to two hundred thirty-six TMUs, and it went up to sixty-five oh five, and then he went up to two hundred forty, and it went up to sixty-six fifteen. So it was scaling with with shader count, with the TMU count as well. Even the one balanced per. And it went to 6756 cool at 4096 shaders. So hmm. it's interesting. Before overclocking. So, yeah, he was achieving um, higher results consistently as he went through these utilities. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And these it makes are- me want to get one hmm. if I could get one because I checked and these cards are not available. The Strix cards? No, it's out of stock. Yeah. They are dual bias cards, too. So, I mean, there's not really. A lot to lose. Oh, that's true. They are dual BIOS cards, yep. so if you fl- if you f it up, just probably switch to two before you flash it. Slip the flash switch. On two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but the sapphire is available. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Both of them are good. All right, that's that's it for the news this week, guys. Let's get into our hardware software picks of the week. Um, my pick is as Ken is reaching over there. So last week. If you watch the video version of the podcast, you may have noticed that our visual visual quality changed, uh, I'd say, five-sixths of the way through uh, the show. And that was because the initial camera we had started using was this guy. This is the Panasonic Lumix DMC GH4, otherwise known as a Panasonic GH4. This is a relatively inexpensive but high-quality 4K camera. So it obviously does stills. But it also is uh, capable of 4K, 30 hertz, video capture, very high quality. Uh, And so we used this for uh, much of the podcast last week. And uh, if you watch, if you go watch that 3DFX Voodoo 3 2000 unboxing video, we recorded it on this camera for the first time as well and uploaded, edited, and uploaded in 4K to boot. So now this is, it's not cheap. These are, I I don't want to say this is the least expensive 4K capable, like kind of high quality video recording hardware, uh, but it's pretty close. This is 14 or 1500 bucks body only. This particular uh, lens we have on here is Olympus 12 to 40 mil, which is like another thousand dollars. Is that right, Ken? Yeah, so this is a $2,500 kit of hardware. Um, and you're just throwing it back and forth between your hands like it's nothing. I didn't pay for it yet. Like we're just borrowing it to test. Uh, from, our, drop it. from our good friends at uh, BH Photo, uh, who are nice enough to lend it to us. So we're debating kind of, you know, upgrading some cameras to this, using these for trade shows or event coverage. Um, so far, I really like it. And, and actually, the lens itself, I don't know if I've ever had a $1,000 lens before. Um, this is a micro four thirds, right? Yeah. So it's smaller than, than what you maybe would think of for DSLR stuff, uh, but it just feels nice. Like it's, everything is metal. There's no plastic in terms of like the zooming functionality or anything. Um, you should cut it in half because the internals are fantastic. All right. I'll get the Dremel out in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no bandsaw <laughs> and watch your fingers. All right. Fair enough. Um, so we're, we're, we're thinking about it. I, I would really like to not have to pay $2,500 for the upgrade process, but I guess Panasonic doesn't really like send us hardware often. So <laughs> if anybody from Panasonic is paying attention, I'll talk about how great your GH4 is if you can send me one. Or any other camera great. company. Or any, yeah, like if Lol, Sony. Well, I'm a professional photographer. I'll talk about your stuff if, all the time. If Lol. Sony if Sony wants to send over something to, and I know we have people that uh, watch our shows from Sony because this remote was shipped to us from somebody who works at Sony. When they saw us messing with this TV and trying to change the inputs, they sent us a remote that had been pre-programmed and on a set of buttons to like input one, two, three, four uh, across the top. He says, here, this will help you out. So if you're listening and you are part of the camera division and not the, just the remote controls, you uh, let me know. Get those frames per second cameras, you yeah, know. you let me know. Oh, also, you can get it with this interface unit right here, which is and offers SDI output 
full size HDMI output XLR input for microphones. In theory. In theory, we couldn't get it to work. We actually have that uh, kit as well, uh, and it's only five hundred bucks more. So extended battery life. It does not. Aw. Actually, which is a little disappointing. As big as it is, you would think it would add some battery life to it, um, which is obviously necessary if you're going to use it for recording podcasts. You should get an AC adapter if you're going to do that. But let's be let's be honest there. So. Uh, who's up next? Did I? Did who's I skip always somebody? up next? Come yeah, on, I know, but I think I might have missed somebody here. Alan, okay, let's do this. Yeah, Alan, what do you got, Alan? Alan, oh, that's right, that's right. Alan, Aaron peanuts. He ditched us. Alan, 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 Steve, Steve. Yeah. So last week it was uh, wireless hospital gadgets being hacked uh, in a way that could well kill people, which was just lovely, yeah. and now. We've got a guy at DEF CON who showed off turning a little Mattel Girl Tech IM Me text messaging box into something that can open any wireless garage door in three seconds and is able to block the signal from a uh, remote keyless entry twice so that it can capture two good codes and then let you into your car and now they've because the thing with the codes is once they're used you can never use them again but with this thing because it blocks it they can just store as many as they bloody well feel like which means that within about 30 seconds they've opened your garage turned your car on and have driven away not worrying at all like you shouldn't worry about this sort of thing whatsoever hopefully they're working on fixing it this is the same guy that uh, figured out how to turn it on on off the GM cars a couple of weeks ago. Man, I hope that guy's doing good stuff instead of just annoying people. Well, he's telling us about it, so. Well, that's true. Because this is stupidly easy to do. <laughs> this just reminds me of Tamagotchi. Anyway. I'm uh, going to burn down my garage. Josh, what do you got for us? Didn't you pick this last week? or didn't No, no, no. You see, this is a wheel replacement. There's one thing I kind of dislike oh about the God. TX wheel that uh, I bought. The base unit is great. It's solid. The, the brushless motor is good. The pulley system is so much better than, than the previous helical gear unit I have. But the actual wheel itself is chintzy feeling. It's, it's really cheap. And for only $99 more, you can get something that is a lot more solid looking, better feel, and it has that really nice anodized aluminum thing at the top that tells you where the center of the wheel's at. And uh, if you look at like the Fanatec wheels, that you can replace them on, on their units, they're like 300 and some odd bucks. And at least Thrustmaster is giving you something a whole lot more affordable at $99. $99.99. Thank you. <laughs> so what? That's five hundred dollars. So in... you bought no, it's, a racing it's, uh, wheel, oh, and then and yeah. then replaced the wheel. Well, not yet, but I'd like to. I have to wait till my allowance comes in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and they don't sell this unit with this wheel on it. Correct. These sons of bees. Hey, you know what? It's I see a new side it's, business. It's, it's the aftermarket. The, hey, this uh, this is sold by Capitalism. Photo Savings. What? It's sold by a company called Photo Savings. Oh, well. Huh. I wonder if you can get a deal with them. Maybe they sell GH4s. <laughs> Maybe they do. That is, a, that is a pretty cool looking wheel. It's nice. I nice mean, looking. It's I don't, bigger. I don't, honestly don't remember how it's different than the previous one. So. Yeah, it's strange it's kind of almost like Ooh, it's got a wiper button. Yeah. Is it for your windshield or your butt? Butt. <laughs> nice. I, I sit on a bidet. <laughs> Yep, well, and gaming. it'll be pits, too. All right, who's last? Why do you oh, ever wait, think Sebastian. that you never see me from below this level? Because we're smarter than that? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got for us, Sebastian? Oh, that's very loud. Anyway. Oh, I like that music. That didn't work well at all. But if you play this too is, much of it, we'll get taken This is down. Final Fantasy Tactics running on my Nexus 6. What? Final Fantasy Tactics has finally made it to Android in the U.S. after being in Japan only for a while. Where do you hook up and your uh, PlayStation controller? Bluetooth. Um, uh, wait, don't you use one of those, uh, what was that thing? Ookla? A shield? Yes. <laughs> yes I, don't know if it's, I don't know if it's available on that yet. <gasps> it would be. But it works just fine. It works exactly like it does on the iPhone or the iPad. It's the same up version. This is obviously the same 
uh, source that they use when they created the iPad version a couple years ago. Square Enix is using that. So on my ridiculous, you know, 2560 by 1440 Nexus 6 screen, it has a very high um, resolution that looks very smooth. All the text is very smooth. The characters have been up res, so looks great and it's cheaper right now it's these uh, square enix is famous for very expensive apps usually yep. like 15.99 a game so this thing is an odd nine dollar and seventy cent price for its introduction it won't let me install it to my shield tv why not Boom. i don't know it's grayed out this item is not compatible with your device i can install it to my sense. shield tablet now is the shield tv Using Tegra? No, it's using Android TV. It's using Android TV. Not just Android. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you okay. can... <laughs> I can install it to my OnePlus One. But will it install on this PlayStation TV? Probably not. My Zen phone. I guess you could run the my PS1. And obviously the answer is yes. Run the PS1 Classic on it. I can install it to my GS4. My Nexus 7. You haven't had a GS4 in It just a lists while. everything. I haven't taken all the phones out. Maybe your Shield TV has been plugged in recently enough to let you install it. I don't think that's accurate. I, I don't know. know. I, I know it's different because it's an Android TV device and not just that, but I, I think maybe if you I think if you do it from Android TV, you can sometimes just download the apps anyway. It's it's all about the interface, not just being use a, your so, original, since there's no touch screen. Yeah. They're, they're more they're user more original now. Nvidia Shield with the built-in controller. I, I loved Final Fantasy Tactics, and I know a lot of people despised it when it came out for it not being the JRPG that they had hoped it to be. But I hate those people now. I did get this on the iPad a while ago. We were talking about before the show, so it's kind of weird on the iPad. It's almost too big. It, it's it's fantastic. It's got fantastic music. Um, and uh, I loved I, I did run a Final Fantasy website for a long time I always had to make myself remember that I ran a Star Wars fan site and a Final <laughs> Fantasy fan site nerd for a long time boy you must have been very lonely as a teenager <sighs> what makes you think I'm not a lonely person now <laughs> in my you surround yourself by Ken and Alan that's why I had a baby so I can have some Friends, somebody who actually likes three me three dogs and a wife because they're forced to and you were in a fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not in my 30s. Or my teens. Well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's yeah. going to be it for the show this week, guys. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Again, pcper.com slash live. You can join us on Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. If you go to pcper.com slash subscribe, uh, you can find a way to uh, sign up for a little mailing list. And uh, we'll add your name to the roll call, if you will, that we send out before each and every live stream. We are still planning, and I just said something right before we started the stream. We are still trying to do this Logitech event. Josh, I need to find a time for you when you're available uh, to do a racing event with us. Because you know all the racing games. You know how we can yeah. set it up. Uh, yeah. I just want to do some live streaming with our Logitech wheel and uh, just play some games. And um, I'm really just going to turn around. I want you to pick out games and modes. The let okay. me turn around 180 degrees and drive backwards trying to hit you on the course. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good plan. Because, I mean, that's really what I do in racing games. Because if I'm really trying to race, like, you have way more experience and practice than me. I'm not going to be any good uh, unless we have a game that has, like, guns or rockets that shoot out of the front of the car. Rockets. So, Carmageddon, though. Yeah, sure. We could. Yeah, we try that. Can you play Rocket League with? I don't a wheel? know if I can play Rocket League with it. I keep saying I'm going to try it. I guess I could do that. Uh, I did play. We just got in one of the new Acer 3440 by 1440 34 inch, uh, 21 by 9 widescreen curved monitors. It's perfect for Rocket League, by the way, because you can cheat and you get to see a little bit more of the sides. Of, uh, of, uh, of the field. So I highly encourage that. It's worth $1,000 just to play Rocket League a little bit better, uh, I think, at least. Um, yeah. Yeah, at the very least. That's it, guys. Go to PCPro.com. Check out the reviews and the content that we've posted. And uh, if you like our videos, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash PCPro is where you can go for that. And, and again, PCPro.com says podcast. If you want to find all the back episodes to our show, we highly encourage you to do so. And we thank everybody for watching and keeping up with us indeed. So uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Sebastian Peake. Bye.